Thank you for having me here. I want to thank Chester and Phil and Gary for doing this. I also want to let you know that I hate Phil. <laughs> and the reason why I hate Phil is this title was really his. You know, so I might have called this the Marco Polo seminar, the history of world trade, environment, culture, and everything else, because it's such a large topic. So I've, I've made some decisions about what I'm going to cover. You'll be the ultimate judges about whether or not they were good or bad decisions and you can draw your own conclusions on that. Uh, yesterday, Carl and I got to spend a lot of time with the Chinese contingent here, which we were very grateful to hear about the work that they were doing, and I would be remiss if we didn't say, it is the year of the pig. I think pigs have a beautiful personality. That's what's working for me, and are blessed with good fortune in life. Now, my friend Phil is always interested in quotes, so we'll start with what I think is a very interesting quote from the man, Marco Polo. I speak and I speak, but the listener retains only the words he is expecting. It's not the voice that commands the story, it's the ear. So for about the next few moments, I'd like to command your ear. Here's what we're going to talk about today. So at least you have a sense of, my God, when will this be over? so you can figure out where we are at any point in time. Now this is being videotaped. What I hate about videotape is that you can then use my own words clearly against me, unless of course you're Donald Trump and you can say that you misspoke even though it was on videotape. Okay, Xi, Xi Premier, President, Leader of China, okay? A little bit of history, just do some background on these folks. Uh, he won uh, nationwide acclaim for his anti-corruption campaign. Uh, he was given the title of core leader. Mao Zedong held that before him. And by the way, in 2017, his name and ideology was enshrined. He's only the only other person was Mao to ever have that happen. Uh, term limits for the presidency were abolished last year. So he's going to be around for pretty much as long as he wishes to be around. Okay, and that's important to understand. Uh, I love this. I'm never guided by a possible assessment of my work. President Putin, that sounds pretty right to me. He came to power while well, he was in the KGB. He came to power when he took over the fights against the rebels in Chechnya. When Yeltsin unexpectedly resigned, Putin was named acting president. The first thing he did was rearrange 89 regions in the seven. I've been to Russia, by the way, nine times for no less than two weeks each trip. So I've been there a lot. Uh, he serves as Prime Minister of Medvedev when he was forced to leave the presidency, but he's back again, and he's moved quickly to stifle dissent and pretty much to cement his ability to continue serving. Uh, they have troops in Ukraine and Syria, and he's been implicated in several highly visible poisonings here in the United Kingdom. So be careful. Huh. A couple things we should know about. And I picked Russia, China, and the U.S. I mean, there's so many countries to choose from, but I picked some of the big players for various reasons. I hope that will become clear. Russia is the 11th largest economy in the world. It's dwarfed by the U.S. and China. I mean, it's peanuts compared to both of us. Look at, I think this is fascinating. China's per capita growth is approaching that of Russia's, their GDP, but yet they have eight times the number of people. That should give you some idea about what's going on in this economy. Their GDP is growing three times faster than Russia, so that distance is just going to continue to grow. Now, Russia's military expenditures are lower than China's, and Russia's always prided itself on its military expenditures, and so that gap is going to continue to grow as well. Russia's probably the more immediate and proximate military threat right now. They've used invasions, intimidation, assassinations, and data manipulations, and we've recently just seen the Bruja over uh, medium, intermediate, long-range missiles in the United States have withdrawn from that treaty. But China is the far greater global economic power. And that's not about the change. To ignore China is stupid. It's absolutely stupid, okay? Uh, just to give you some sense of that, there's China's investments, and you can see the colors go literally. It's very nice the way this is put together. The colors match exactly on the right, so the top is South America all the way down. 
China has made enormous investments in Africa. Enormous investments in Africa. I, I don't mean this as a criticism. They're not dumb. They're doing it for a reason. There's where their investments in Africa are. Transport and uh, energy and the metals and things like that. They're all over Africa. They're all over Africa. There's almost no nation in Africa you cannot go to where China does not have some presence of some kind. Now, why are they doing that? Well, I want to secure a solid base of raw materials to fund our growth. I want to be well positioned in probably the next major growth area in terms of trade and economics in this century. They're positioning themselves there. But look at my third paragraph there. 90% of the world's supply of platinum and cobalt, half of the world's gold supply, two-thirds of the world's magnesium, and 35% of the world's uranium. Africa accounts for 75% of the world's coltan and important mineral use in electronic devices. Again, no other country on the face of the earth has the depth, the breadth, and I could have put the length of engagement that China has in Africa. We've been ignoring them, the United States. I have to make at least some passing comment about Brexit. After all, I'm in the United Kingdom. You should kill me if I didn't make some comment about that. The biggest thing with, with Brexit, and I think many of you would agree, is the uncertainty. You know, nature pours a vacuum. Business hates uncertainty. And part of the problem is we don't know what's going to happen. We can all say, here's our favorite prediction. But the truth is we simply don't know until it happens. But businesses are starting to take action. I think it was Nissan, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's just canceled a plant that was going to build here and instead going to build it at home. The financial community is another one you should keep your eye on because there are many financial places here from other countries because A, you speak English and you're close to Europe and you're part of the European Union. Some things might happen there along the way. And obviously what happens will have an impact on global trade as well. And my crystal ball is no better than anyone else's in this room, and I've eaten a lot of ground glass in my life, and I'll probably eat more later on. Sigh. Now we go to Donald. <laughs> I had to really carefully look around for photos, because there are a lot of photos that make him look stupid. Now, it may be because he is stupid, but I was trying to be kind. Notice a the quote there. The concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. Folks. I'm embarrassed. We have a president who lives in a world occupied only by him, where truth is elastic. Truth is whatever he says it is going to be and goes along the way and what happened. And God, there are more criminal investigations going on around him than probably all the hairs on people's heads in this room. And I have no idea how that's going to play out. I was up late last night listening to the State of the Union address. After I heard it, I wanted to kill myself. Uh, because once again, one of the comments he made was he's sure that if he was not president, we'd be at war with North Korea right now. Now, I'm sure we'll hear how that was a misstatement put us on tape, or he was misinterpreted. Uh, and he said very little about global trade. But what he did say is, I'm going to build the wall. And that's part of the problem. What's our trade and economic policy? I don't know. You tell me. I have no idea. I don't think the people in the Trump administration know what our policies. Look at what we've been doing. Make America great again. Excuse me while I turn my back and throw up. But that's what we're doing. By the way, and that is being seen by many of our allies as a repudiation of long-term arrangements. If you think about it, why not make Britain great again? Why not make Germany great again? It really is an inward focusing. Look at what he has done. He started trade wars with China and Europe. He's walked away from NAFTA, the tr uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership from the climate accords and again this intermediate policy. He seems to walk away from a lot of stuff and doesn't necessarily propose anything else to deal with it. He is focused on this wall. Some of you may have noticed we shut down government in America for 35 days, the longest shutdown in history, and at the end I'm holding in my hands what he achieved. Let me give you another angle in case you can't see it. He got absolutely nothing. The political dynamics have changed dramatically. He has found out that Nancy Pelosi is a worthy and tough adversary. Now, so let's talk about trade, okay? Here's China's exports. Uh, these are the latest data. 218 has not yet been released, or at least I've not found a website that's given me the data for it, so it may be better. 
I think it's interesting that China still considers exports of Hong Kong as exports, but I think that's because of that special relationship. But all I want you to look at here are two things. Look at the volume, the dollar volume, okay? And look at the, the value of the trade with the United States as compared with anywhere else. I think I could make an argument with you very carefully and clearly that at least in the short to intermediate term, it will be hard for China to replace the dollar volume of trade it has with the United States with any other country, just because of the size. Here are their imports. South Korea, Japan, you see the United States is much smaller. We'll talk about that in a minute. And I did find at least in one of the charts, it did say that was Hong Kong. You see, there you are there. Here is Russia. Notice the size differential. Notice the dollar differential. I'll go back really quick. The top, their top exports are to China, 38 billion. Notice China's top exports are 430 billion, more than 15 times that. So when we say Russia is not a major economic player, they're not. But the concern is they're a large country. They border Europe in a variety of ways, and they still have a great number of ways to threaten world peace. Here are the imports. China's a big player for them. If we go to the United States, there's our exports. Uh, the, I've not been able to figure out the numbers. These numbers I've got from the same website. So those who are looking closely say, wait a minute, John, those exports to China of 130 don't match what you said China's imports were. Mm -hmm. You're right, I don't know. But they are less than China's imports to the US. And here's our exports. I'm sorry, imports. You see it's a bigger number than before. In essence, the only point that I'm trying to make to you is that China, in a trade war, is really dependent on United States imports. And that indeed, China's economy has started to slow, and so that's a concern for China. Now you might say, well, what can they do about it, John? Well, let's look at the debt side for a moment. China owns a lot of US debt a lot of US debt, okay? Almost one third of all debt held outside the United States, China has in its grasp, okay? That could be extraordinarily threatening and impactful to the value of the dollar. What helps is China doesn't want to necessarily drive down the value of the dollar because of all the dollars they hold. So it's like they shoot themselves in the foot there. So they're not ready to do that just yet. Okay. Own almost one third. I tell you why. They, it helps their economy grow. They'd like to keep it low. Uh, geez, that, by the way, when the dollar value drops, what often they do is they buy treasuries because they're cheaper. But the dollars they have on hand, they buy treasuries. So they increase their, their investment in the United States in that way. It's worked. Their economy grew 10% for the last three years. 10% for the last three years. That's an extraordinary figure. Now, it slowed down at about 7% last year, which is a more sustainable rate. China is or will surely become the largest economy in the world. Depends some places look, they say they are the largest economy. They will become the largest economy. U.S. economy is growing about 3.5%. China is growing about 7%. You can do the math. They're going to catch up at some point in time. The last paragraph that I find absolutely fascinating. China has more money in its foreign currency reserves than the entire economies of Brazil, Mexico, and Russia produce in a year. China could buy Venezuela in cash. They say, I, I want to buy a country. Venezuela, they could literally buy them in cash and still have millions and trillions of gold, euros, and dollars left over. I want to give you some sense of the amount of money, the mountain of money that they are sitting on, which really allows them to do a lot of things along the way. Now, here's one of the things I really want you to take a look at. Here's what I was trying to make as clear as I could. Look at this trade war. You can see the numbers up there. You can see that essentially the total value in 2017 here of Chinese imports from the U.S. 130 billion. The total value uh, is 506 billion in China. So you can see that's almost a five to one, four point something one ratio to another. So I mean, literally, China can put on tariffs on every product that they get from the United States which is, I mean, okay, and we can still do it in four times as many products. Now, there is a hold on the tariff wars right now, 
If I remember correctly, it's a 90-day hold. Trump does not seem to be one who is conciliatory. And I think the fact that he lost the battle over the wall with Nancy Pelosi has only hardened his positions. So I'm, remember, I'm willing to eat ground glass. You can look at this tape maybe a, a month from now and see where I was wrong. But I don't think he's going to move a lot here unless he gets some serious concessions. Now, this tit for tariff, tariff, tariff uh, battle, tariff battle. What does it mean? Well, it'll shave off five percent global, or five tenths of percent, half percent of global growth. Okay, manufacturing sector in China is slowing, and tariff concerns are there. Full-blown escal escalation could knock 0.81 percentage points off global domestic product. Okay, and that'd be the 25 percent China and the EU. By the way, I never quite understood that. I thought that Trump could have had an easy win. You know that automobiles coming into Europe from the United States have a 12% tariff. Automobiles coming from Europe into the United States have a 4% tariff. I'm not complaining about any of that stuff, but wouldn't it have been better politically and smart to go to Europe and say, hey, we got three choices for you here. Choice number one, we're gonna raise our tariffs to 12%, just to match yours. Could go any higher, any lower. Second, we could meet in the middle at eight. We, you, know, you lower yours to eight, we raise ours to eight. Third, we could meet at four. I have no idea, and I've talked to people in Washington, nobody knows where the 25% figure is. Like, oh, what am I feeling like? 25%. Uh, I'm glad it wasn't a 50% day, but it was a 25% day. Most of the impact will come through disruption of domestic and international supply chains and have an impact this year. You start with protectionism and isolationism, and then you just don't beggar your neighbor, you beggar yourself. What everyone is hoping is this is a blip, and it will go away. But I remind you, people are not paying attention so much to the tariffs that he's imposing on Europe. The big focus right now is on China. That's what's eating up a lot of the press, China. And he also, by the way, just announced another meeting with North Korea. Well, we can do the battle in other ways. Okay, so I can escalate the battle on terrace in different ways. So what do I do? Meng Zhuo, or Meng Wangzhou, did I get that right, folks? Close enough. Uh, she goes to Canada, big mistake, because the U.S. immediately demands her extradition because they're uh, accusing the company of lying about the firm's ties to other organizations. And so Canada has detained her. And in response, China has arrested a Canadian diplomat. So you notice the trade war can escalate into other adjacent arenas having nothing whatsoever to do with trade. Now, take a look at this. Boeing right now has $1.1 trillion order for planes from China. That could go away tomorrow. Starbucks has openly said they see China as their biggest market by 2025, but that was before the tariffs started or other issues. Westinghouse, which is pretty much a bankrupt U.S. company, is doing very well in China. Tesla, Apple, you all know how much Apple produces in China. One, one funny little thing, which probably most of you would never be aware of that's occurred out of the trade war. The United States, we ship a lot of our trash to China. Literally, there's something like 2,000 uh, freight tankers, freighter tankers a day go to China pulling our trash in. What China has done is they have reduced the acceptable contamination levels of that trash. I think about trash contamination this isn't all contaminated. I thought it was too. But they reduced it from 5% to 1%. Now, they did that while many of these freight boats were en route and they had to turn around. In the United States right now, we have suddenly stopped. We no longer accept for recycling. That's what they were sending. We no longer accept plastic or glass in recycling because China has declared that as unacceptable and as contamination. Just a little stop, just little things to tweak us along the way. Car manufacturers, big in China. Food, agriculture, soybeans, big. Oil and gas, finance companies, investment in the U.S. So there are a lot of ways to retaliate. China, for example, could slow down inspections of exports of Apple products leaving the United States. China could introduce new inspections of companies and things like that, all in retaliation. 
So a lot of things can happen to be under the radar. Now here's a scary quote. Just think about that for a moment. Eugene Debs is a socialist candidate for president at the turn of the century through about the 1940s or so. And I think it's very interesting. Sooner or later, every war of trade becomes a war of blood. I was talking to Professor Davies before you, you came in here. There are several historians who have argued and provided data that in the years leading up to World War I and World War II, there were increasing trade barriers. Now, the doctoral students I talked to, it's not causality. They did not prove causality, but they just showed an interesting correlation before the last two large wars, trade barriers started being erected. Wow, I don't know what to do about that. Now I'm gonna to shift to a very different area. Carla's gonna mention it. Carl and I have been doing a lot of work in the last several years on demographics. Kind of like a boring subject. And I knew nothing about it. The reason why I knew something about it is years ago, Carla Moore <coughs> called me up and said, why don't you come to Ashridge? And I said, okay, why not? And she said, yeah, and why don't you deal with the topic of aging? And I was like, I'm old, does that count? <laughs> no, I had to do something more sophisticated. So we've been working on that. Here's the world population growth through 2100. <coughs> you will notice the spike that occurred in the 60s, and then the slanting, rapid, downward growth rate worldwide. Now, what this hides, which I'm going to show you, you might look at that and say, oh, okay, good, that maybe will put less pressure on food. Isn't that a good idea? What's the problem? Why not, John? Why are you upset about this? Well, look at the shape. The blue in the center is world population in 2050. Notice the, the flatness of the triangle at the bottom through 30 years and below. Then in 2017, notice we're widening. And in 2100, notice the bulge of elderly. Notice the huge bulge of elderly people. Oh, look at that pearl, I do have a little thing right there. Look at that bulge of elderly people. That's me. Last year, first time in recorded history, the number of people over age 60 exceeded the number of people under age 16 worldwide. Worldwide, okay? In Europe, by 2050, and most of you will all be alive in 2050. If I'm alive, that'll be a miracle. But most of you will be alive in 2050. The number of people in Europe over the age of 80 will exceed the number of people under the age of 16. That has profound implications. First of all, think workforce. How many 80-year-olds you know work a 40-hour day? Okay. Number two, think healthcare. Healthcare statistics suggest that more than one-third of the cost of healthcare occurred in the last 10 years of your life. So what I want you to understand is when people talk about world population growing, they're not providing you enough statistics. World population is growing because older people are living longer. BBC News, Tuesday. Tuesday ran a story about 600 people a day in the United Kingdom are leaving work to care for their elderly parents. That seems to me like a big number. 600 people a day and more than 5 million people who are working right now are preparing for uh, taking care of the elderly parents. Now, think about China. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I'll give you another figure that I find absolutely fascinating. According to demographers during the one-child policy, 400 million live births were eliminated in China during that entire period. 400 million. That's greater than the population of Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Now, I'm not making any comment about it, but look at what that does to your pool of people. You don't replace 400 million people in a few years. Think about what it does going through to your working class and age population. Total fertility rate. The fertility rate is what you want to look at, not birth rates. Okay? And fertility rates, I'll tell you right now, demographers argue that in order to sustain a population without migration, not grow it, the fertility rate is 2.1. I don't know how you produce a tenth of a child. That's what it is. That's what they say to sustain it, okay. 
total fertility rates. You'll notice no country up there with the exception of India and France is barely on the brink, is basically producing enough folks to maintain its current population size. That's not to grow. Italy needs immigration of 100,000 people a year to maintain the size of its workforce. Not to grow it, not to expand it, but to maintain the size. I would suggest to you that for the young people here in this room, the battle in the future is going to be a lot, it's going to be over people. It's not just going to be over resource. I have all the resource, but I don't have anyone to work with, and what do I do with them? It's going to be a battle over people. Let's go, go a little bit further here. China, because it is Marco Polo, it's China, it's a year, and I think China is a crucial economic player. Let me talk to you about dependency for a minute. It's another demographic term. The red is old age dependency, and the blue is youth dependency ratios. What does that mean? The assumption that demographers make in figuring out what this is, is that people age 0 to 16 are not working and are dependent on people age 17 to 64, and people over 64 are not working and are dependent on 17 to 64. So the dependency ratio is you take the number of people over 16 in the society, and you take the number of people over 64, and they're the ones that are dependent on that working group. Just take a look there, both age and youth dependency are skyrocketing in China. For much the same reasons everywhere else. China has a lower birth rate, people are living longer. By the way, dependency ratios throughout the world are climbing. This is not just a Chinese problem. Dependency ratios, and by the way, remember the assumption there? 17 year working. If you look at Greece, Portugal, Spain, and Italy, the unemployment rates of people age 18 to 30 is approaching 50%. So if you're unemployed, you're now dependent too. And that assumption is that at 17, you can be employed. That's being all blown to hell too. And so that's not being counted here. I don't know about any, any of you. I find this scary. Now, the good news is I'm old and I'm going to die. I'm sorry to be so narrowly Not dope. for a long oh, time. Huh? It's not for a long time. Yeah, but, but, I mean, but the rest of you are going to have to deal with this. Now, I'm going to address some things specifically to the Chinese students that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, yes, just, uh, I just have to do one more thing here to show you one more, one more piece of data. Let's see if I can do this right. There is the Chinese birth rate per woman in 2016, 1.62. If you go online, you can find photos of Chinese families in like 1970, and the photo would be as large as the number of people in this room, the extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, and sisters. Then you go to 2015, and there are about four of them there. There are about four of them there. So that's what that slide was reminding me to go there. There is the birth rates of what is going on all the way through 2010. And one of the things I just want to point out to you is, you can see where India, this is India right here, has been exceeding China's birth rate. India will become, in the next 20 years, the most populous country on the face of the earth. They will exceed, I would have thought that one, but they will exceed it. But notice how all the numbers are trending below two. The question is, where are the bodies going to come from for the future? By the way, this is kind of like the depressing part. If I haven't made you depressed, I'm working hard, okay? 1.4 billion. There are 34 million males and females in China right now. More than the population of Malaysia, who, if you'll forgive my bluntness, will never find, will never find wives and only rarely have sex. Now I'm assuming the 34 million guys are not all gay. I don't have a problem with gayness, but I'm assuming some of them want to be married, okay? Millions of couples. Let's, let's go on further. Look at the birth gap. There's 2018. There's the data through 2100. In 2018, 45 million boys were born, 35 million girls. Between India and China, there are 50 million more boys than women. Now, for the Chinese women here, hey, you can have that pick of whatever. You, you don't have, you can, you can just wait and sell for the best. 
the Chinese guys, you got a problem. We can become agents. That's by right. You, you got well, wait a minute. You're going to see some. You got a problem. I mean, think about two things. One, if I want to get married, and in the culture, getting married is a big deal. We're talking about a cultural issue. If I want to get married, where am I going to find a wife? I'm, I'm very serious. And where are we going to live? Notice, I might find a lovely Chinese lady in Vietnam who says, I'm not coming back to China. So that's some interesting issues there. There's just another look at the dependency ratio. I'm just skipping by. That's just another view. Now, age-old rhythms of family life. Adult sons live with their mothers, in some cases their grandmothers in China. India <coughs> Chinese women who show a marked preference for sons are growing old. They're still burdened with cooking clean for their adult sons. One said, I've cried so much I can't see anymore. Look at the bride price. You used to have a few hundred bucks. In many areas of China right now, you want a bribe? You need 30 grand. So ladies, now you know what kind of a reasonable asking price is. You know, if you're being offered a few hundred, forget it. Having sons was once a hedge against poverty and old age. Now elderly parents are sacrificing to help their sons appear marriageable and to support those sons who fail to find a bride. And there are going to be more sons don't find a bride. Remember demographics we're talking about? Think about what that does to the population over time. China last year, for the first time in its history, has labor shortages. Who would have thought of that? China, the labor shortage is some sort of joke. They have labor shortages right now. And they're actively trying to bring people in to immigrate. Now, part of the problem is I'm really stupid. I mean that honestly. I, the Chinese language I find incredibly difficult. Now, for those people who are not Chinese, who speak Chinese, you have the greatest respect of me, uh, from me, and I mean that quite honestly. So, I mean, so China's not on my list of places I want to go and work. I love China, but I couldn't work there. A portion of men will fail to find brides, but they're going to stay in the marriage market competing with younger men to marry younger women. By 2050, French demographer Christophe Guimoto says there could be between 150 and 190 men in China for every 100 women. So if you're a woman, it's a buyer's market, babe. If you're a guy, I'm sorry, good luck. You know, good luck. Good luck. I probably talked way too long, so I only have a few other things. I want to talk about global currency. I hope everyone knows. I had nothing to do with it. What a boon it is to the United States that the dollar is a global currency. And I hope everyone understands that. I can go worldwide and trade dollars. But some of the other impacts that people don't understand. The United Kingdom wants to go out and buy oil from Saudi Arabia. Guess what? You have to take your pounds and buy dollars because Saudi Arabia only accepts dollars. Now, Iran doesn't, okay, but Saudi Arabia does. So that currency is an enormous scam. There are an enormous number of dollars out there in the world that really prop up our currency. And so when people want to buy oil, for the most part, most of the world's oil countries, they want it in bucks. It's not true. That's starting to change. Now, what's the impact of that? And where are we likely to go? This is my last set, by the way, for those of you saying, does he ever shut up? He does. China and Japan are dumping the dollar in bilateral trade between one another. They're trading dollars. Not being reported in the media anywhere. The BRICS, again, they have started, this is new, they're now using their own currencies when trading. So Brazil will accept the real, accept the, uh, the, 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 come on, I lost my Russian currency, ruble, et cetera, et cetera. Russia and China have a currency agreement. That is, they've been using their own currencies for trading with one another for more than a year. So I will use the yuan or renminbi and we'll accept the ruble, okay? China is the biggest trading partner with Africa, and they're really pushing <coughs> Chinese currency use in Africa, which kind of makes sense. Uh, China UA deal, China US not Arabs have ditched the dollar and use own currencies. Okay, one of the the other things that I've talked that I did not mention is really all the things that China is doing in terms of bidding for business with Africa, because a lot of their businesses are state-owned enterprises so they can be subsidized, subsidized to take some business. So they're really smart. They really are smart. I mean that. Some other things. Iran. China is Saudi Arabia's biggest oil customer. What if China goes to Saudi Arabia and said, we're not going to pay you in dollars anymore? 
The United Nations is pushing for a new world reserve currency for years. They want some other currency other than the dollar. And one UN report talked about a new global reserve system could be created and does not rely on the dollar, but maybe several. The IMF has been pushing for a new world reserve currency. Although, by the way, the president has, a, has proposed the new head of the World Bank, and he is a skeptic of international trade. I can't remember the guy's name, it just came out a few days ago. Uh, there are now, but there haven't been before, some currencies that could really replace the dollar. The euro could be one, and the yuan could be one, but the, they will have to let their currency float. And the question is, are they willing to do that? We're hated. I'm not a fool. We're hated. The United States is hated. America first and make America great again is helping to fan the disgust and hatred on a variety of levels. We're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We have a growing unsustainable debt challenge. Our debt is just taking off. I'm going to argue it's going to, it will be replaced. I think it will be replaced by a basket of currencies, the euro, the dollar, and the won. Some of you are old enough to remember that the dollar is a world reserve currency replaced the British pound. In 1944, the British pound was a global currency. According to some estimates, the dollar will lose the status of the world's currency by 2030. Once again, most of you will be around for that. I was kidding with Carla. The other day we stopped at a bank to get some pounds, and I was really wondering, should I buy pounds now or wait to see what happens with Brexit because they might be a lot cheaper in the future? The only problem was I needed pounds now. I can't feed myself on these looks. I need money to be able to do it. <laughs> Demise of the dollar will bring radical changes to the U.S. And I would call it an economic tsunami. 2008 recession will look like nothing. Undesirable change will have inflation, high interest rates on mortgages and cars, and substantial increase in the cost of food, clothing, gasoline. It will impact in the U.S. every part of our lives. It will also lead to further devaluation of the dollar, which actually has some positive impacts. Our uh, exports will become cheaper. Okay. Now, John Kennedy. To state the facts, frankly, is not to despair the future nor indict the past. The prudent heir takes careful inventory of his or her legacies and gives a faithful account to those whom he owes an obligation of trust. I have the last slide is coming. There is an end. This is mercifully over. Abraham Lincoln, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by simply invading it today. Can't do it. I hope I've given you some food for thought. Uh, neither Chester, nor Phil, nor Gary, nor anyone else is responsible for my ramblings, I am. Thank you very much. How long did that go, Phil? Was I about the right length? That was brilliant. That's excellent.